Okay, uh, let's get started. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, uh, welcome to Patrick Barnard, who is going to talk to us today about uh, uh, coastal flooding around California as a result of climate change. Uh, Patrick is the research director of the Climate Impact and Coastal Processes team at the USGS. Uh, I think, Patrick, you have a background in, uh, in geology. Um, uh, I didn't look at uh, your CV, uh, but uh, most important, uh, you're working on coastal flooding model, not the BAFTA model, but actually using hydrodynamic modeling to uh, estimate the impact of, uh, of rising seas and to the environment and including many different processes as just, uh, added to that, waves, storm surge and, and, and river discharge. And you're working with um, a number of people on uh, how this is going to affect uh, not only humans, but also ecosystems. You have a very uh, active program in, uh, in outreach, uh, and you're going to talk a little bit about that. And you're also uh, very tightly connected with stakeholders, um, something that uh, we as an earth system scientist uh, are, are striving to do more, to connect our science with uh, the people who are going to use it and get their feedback on what's most useful for them. So we, we are very thankful for, for your, your coming uh, virtually here today and talk to us uh, about this and, and exchange it with us uh, throughout the day. So uh, from there, uh, it's all yours, Patrick. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks, Eric, for having me. And I already had a great chat with you, Mateo, and some of the grad students. So days off to a good start. And I'm just going to try and cover a lot of ground here in terms of the research we've been doing at USGS and looking at um, storms and sea level rise impacts on the California coast. And hopefully some of it will stick. And so feel free to reach out afterwards if it doesn't or if you have some follow-up questions or just want to chat. So this, I have about seven modelers that work on this effort along with myself and a number of other people. So I'm just just a talking head. There's a really huge group. And then we also do a lot of work with the state, including Ocean Protection Council, California Natural Resources Agency. Um, and a lot of this work that I'm gonna talk about today was developed for California's fourth climate change assessment, which came out last year. And then we have lots of academic uh, NGO partners as well. So just to move forward here, you know, a common theme we're gonna, talk about is just the fact that we are have all these flooding hazards and really it's only a hazard because we're in the way and you know Newport Beach is a great example we've built really on sort of this razor thin margin between um, at the edge of the ocean and so it's really not that big of a surprise that we are constantly dealing with this hazard of coastal flooding today and it really is an issue today, not just for the future. So we're gonna kind of keep coming back to that kind of concept that we've really just built up our environment in a very vulnerable location to begin with. And we don't need sea level rise to put us in harm's way. We're already already there in a lot of cases. So let's see if I can get this to now move forward. Okay, so sometimes we kind of get questions about just what is the USGS in general? So I'm gonna start there. Um, you know, there's about 8,000 of us across the country um, the Coastal Marine Group is really just about 400 of that, so we're pretty small across the USGS. But what's important is that we're a non-regulatory science agency, so we have no oversight. We don't make any laws. We don't set um, thresholds or boundaries in terms of regulation, so we just do the science. And we have uh, you know, six primary research areas across the USGS, ecosystems, natural hazards, which is where Coastal Marine sits, energy and minerals, environmental health, climate impacts and land use change and water resources. Although that one mission area was recently changed in the middle of the night to land resources. Um, for uh, reasons you may be able to ascertain on your own. So I sit in the Pacific Coastal Marine Science Center in Santa Cruz and our group is about just over 100 and we focus on all aspects of marine geology from you know sort of deep water, and sort of PO type of stuff to classic marine geology, geochem, geophysics, you know, all the way through to coastal engineering. We have a marine facility with marine techs, electronics technicians, do a lot of small boat ops. And then, uh, you know, my group, the coastal processes team, um, this is a little outdated, it's a little bit bigger, but there's three research scientists. And we have six tech support, which are pretty much modelers and usually have a couple of grad students hanging around and then lots of other people throughout USGS contribute to this effort as well. 
So our center's focus is on the Pacific Ocean, the Pacific Basin and the Rim. Um, primarily, I'm looking at coastal and offshore hazards, so tsunamogenic um, sources and, you know, fault mapping, uh, energy and mineral resources, coastal change hazards, which is what I work on, then habitats and ecosystems. So we do a lot of work along the U.S. West Coast, uh, dedicated project in Alaska, a lot of work in the Pacific Islands, all U.S. territories and beyond. But we also co collaborate with groups across the world um, and done work, for example, down in Argentina. We work with the Aussies and the Kiwis and um, Japanese on different projects and a lot of the Europeans as well and also other parts of the U.S. with our other center. So even though our domain is really the Pacific Ocean for this center, we work really all over the place. You know, my current pro projects are kind of split into three different categories. You know, one is coastal processes studies, and just fundamental studies of how the coast uh, changes, evolves through time, and the drivers for that change on all different spatial and temporal scales. And then the larger effort now is, is coastal climate impacts. And the goal of this project is to understand the impact of sea level rise and storms on coastal systems and human systems. And underneath this project is the coastal storm modeling system. And this is the system we developed to look, to explicitly look at the impact of sea level rise and storms across the California coast and now beyond, which we've been developing for about the last 10 years. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about these first two efforts uh, sort of more broadly and then focus a little bit more on the coastal flooding projections that we've been doing. So we have a pretty comprehensive monitoring program of the beaches um, in California. We have three focus areas in San Francisco, Santa Cruz and Santa Barbara, <clears throat> as well as up further north in the Pacific Northwest. We've been working back over 20 years now. And this is really just to gather seasonal and annual data of beach change to help support modeling efforts, make models better, calibrate models, and make better forward-looking projections. So these are becoming now some of the longest uh, continuous data sets in the world and they're being used to develop models all over the place. So um, we kind of keep keeping those going in perpetuity. Um, but to supplement that kind of work and making 3D beach maps, we also do aerial LIDAR, we do ground-based LIDAR here so we can get a better look at the edges of cliffs, for example, on cliff faces and gather you know, millions of points in, in 10 minute scans to get really high resolution information of the morphology. We're doing more and more structure for motion work. So we do this with oblique overlapping aerial images um, to develop digital elevation models. This is a really, exciting sort of advance in the last five years, I'd say, in, in terms of remote sensing, because we can mobilize quickly, we can gather information that's at sort of 10 centimeter scale resolution, and now the accuracy of these DEMs is beginning to approach that of aerial LIDAR, which was sort of the gold standard for about two decades, but now we can collect this kind of information from um, small aircraft or drones, quickly mobilize, and we can now capture these massive events, whereas mobilizing aerial LIDAR could take months. We can get out there in a matter of hours to days. And for example, John Wark's group captured this um, Mud Creek, this massive landslide along Highway 1 back in 2017 um, from oblique aerial photography and then using structure for motion to develop the DEM. So, this is a nice advance in just getting more and more data, um, higher resolution, um, rapid mobilization. So it's a nice additional tool to the toolbox of how we monitor coastal change. Um, the other thing that we do on a regular basis is measure the bathymetry. And we have this uh, jet ski system with kinematic GPS and echo sounders that we go back and forth through the surf zone. Um, up and down the West Coast. We've been doing this in some areas over, for over 20 years now and in California for as much as about 16 or 17. So a lot of coastal change that we observe um, is in the near shore. The beach is really just the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. About 90% of the seasonal change you could see that you, can, you can't see is actually below the surface. So this is just an example of a profile at Ocean Beach in San Francisco from about 30 of these survey is just showing how dynamic that zone is. So we do a lot of work um, looking at how that part of the coast is changing um, just beneath 
the water line to give us a better understanding of how the entire system is evolving. Uh, and lots of other forms of data collection, depending on the study that we're doing, you know, deploying instruments for measuring waves and water levels. We have video cameras in a number of locations uh, for looking at things like rip currents and, and run up lines and in bar locations. A lot of multi-beam bathymetry to look at the surface of the ocean and uh, what that could tell us about the hydrodynamics and the flow features in some of these critical areas, and then um, grain size um, analysis as well. But one of the things we've been focusing on most the last decade in particular is just is continuing to push the envelope in terms of numerical modeling and understanding um, more spatial resolution, the patterns of, of flow and interactions between waves and currents. And this is just an example from San Francisco Bay, which is a very complex current structure. And it's the kind of area where you can't possibly capture the complexity with just a, a handful of in situ instruments. And so this is just an example of where you really have to, um, you know, use numerical modeling, use the, the observations for calibration and validation, but to really get a full understanding of the complexities and, and of a, a particular region, you have to go the numerical modeling route, um, especially in terms of the hydrodynamics. So we do this at the local scale, um, but also do this at the global scale. So in our, our climate work, we're very much interested in the future evolution of the wave climate. And so we take, um, you know, forcing from the latest suite of, of scenarios developed for IPCC and develop global wave models and then dynamically downscale those to regional and local levels for looking at the actual coastal hazards. And this is just an example here of a, one particular model run, which just shows that, you know, even though we're here up in, you know, Southern California, these south facing beaches, the wave climate is in large part controlled by what's happening in the Southern Ocean. You get a lot of energy from the Southern Ocean that's expected to increase. And so, this isn't just a local or a regional problem, it's a global um, scientific problem that has to be solved to understand what's happening in our local, our particular local area. Now, I've been really involved and interested in climate variability, so we're going to get to the long-term climate, but um, short-term climate variability, it really is a dominant control on hazards, especially on the U.S. West Coast. And so got really interested in this back the, during the Central Pacific El Nino in 2009-10, um, the so-called El Nino Motokai. Um, but then, so we've been monitoring this stretch of coast for a long time now, and we saw some interesting patterns with that. There's historically been a lot of um, anecdotal information about the, the massive El Ninos that have hit SoCal in 82, 83, 97, 98. We have a lot more robust measurements now. And so when the 2015-16 El Nino came along, we were ready. And although this was really a, a disappointment from a water resources perspective, we didn't get the typical really heavy rains of an El Nino. It was still one of the most powerful El Ninos on record um, in the top three over the last 150 years. Depending what index you look at, it was number one in the Oceanic Nino Index, even above 97, 98, which just is a which just tracks sea surface temperature in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. Um, but the MEI, which is a little more comprehensive um, indice, it was number three in a reconstruction that goes back to 1871. So it's a very powerful event. Um, but the storm tracks were a bit north, so we didn't get a lot of the rain, but we did get a lot of uh, wave energy. And in the tropical Pacific, it was extremely active. Nine major hurricanes, which was the most ever recorded and also the strongest tropical cyclone ever recorded in terms of maximum sustained wind. So it was a, it was a bomb. We just didn't get the, the rain that we really wanted to as we're in the midst of a drought. But if you look at the oceanographic forcing and you can see what I'm talking about here. And so this is basically looking at the wave energy anomaly every winter since 1997-98 based on the mean for each winter. And so you see, um, and these are uh, wave buoys across the, the whole of the West Coast from Southern California here to um, Washington. But basically we had huge waves in the, this El Nino 97-98 and equally huge waves in 2015-16. So it didn't have the wind, 
in the rain locally, but we had very large waves. And I'm going to talk about why that's important in a second. But what was unusual about this last Del Nino, we typically have this gradient where we have a larger anomaly in Southern California and a little bit more reduced in Pacific Northwest. But this last El Nino, because of the storm tracks were, have been migrating further north over the last several decades, they didn't drop down as far. And so actually there wasn't as big of an anomaly in Southern California. We didn't get the, and we, we didn't get those direct hits in that, that rainfall. Uh, but we're also lucky in that we had about five years of below average wave energy leading into this El Nino. And so that let the, the beaches were in pretty good shape before that happened. Um, second figure, or panel down here is the direction anomaly. And so typically El Nino, we have a big shift to the south, like we did in 97, 98, um, where waves come more out of the south and it really disrupts littoral patterns across the region. And we had the same thing in 2009, 10, but we really didn't have this anomaly in 2015, 16, because these storm tracks were further north, the waves were coming more from the north. So we didn't have these dramatic shifts in sediment supply along littoral cells as we did. And whether this is a sign of things to come is hard to tell, but there is definitely a more polar migration of storm tracks in the background. Um, last thing that we typically get during El Nino is in addition to bigger waves and uh, more southerly waves, and with the exception of 2015-16, is we have warmer water. Um, we have these coastally trapped waves that move up and up the coast. And so we get higher water levels, you know, on the order of 10 to 20 centimeters, like we had in 97, 98, about 10 centimeters in 29, 10, and about 10 centimeters as well in 2015, 16. So we often use these El Ninos as an indication of what sea level rise might look like in the future, sort of with elevated water levels for entire season and coastal storms on top of it. Okay, so we looked, we pulled together survey data from across the U.S. West Coast for this El Nino. And we have this, this incredible sort of detail of the shoreline response across all these different areas going back 20 years or so. And so all these different sites. And what we found, you know, we had this big accretion sort of event lasting over about five years or so. And then this El Nino hit and we had some of the most dramatic beach um, reductions in California history because of the wave energy and also the fact that the beaches were quite um, heavily accreted. Um, but this is very typical. We have this kind of reset during all these El Nino events. We have significantly elevated wave energy so the beaches are eroded and then it takes some time to recover just about till we get to another El Nino event. And so that's what's shown on the top here. And then in the middle here is the erosion anomaly of that winter. And you can see 2015, 16 just sticks out across all the different study areas in terms of some of the, the most significant erosion ever recorded on record across the US West Coast. Um, but, you know, significantly sort of um, much, much less erosion in the years preceding, which was a benefit to the communities so that it wasn't already in an eroded state when that El Nino hit. Another thing just to comment on too, is that um, precipitation matters. So we had this very unusual El Nino where we had large waves and um, very little rain. So if you have a lot of rain, typically the watersheds are moving sediment out um, to the coast and we can have some resupply. We're in the midst of a drought. And in fact, we saw a reduction in one of our proxy beaches in terms of sediment supply dramatically during the course of the drought shown here and then an additional reduction during El Nino. So the patterns of precipitation and oceanographic conditions are important for the long-term evolution of the coast. So just to summarize here, we had you know, beach erosion that was about 76 above, 76% 76 above average. We saw historical minimums at a number of beaches in California, um, but the landward movement was buffered by nourishments and some lower energy winters beforehand. The drought was a major factor. And so this work was summarized in Nature Communications paper um, a couple of years back. We also pulled together data from across the Pacific um, to look at the response of different other modes of climate variability. And so we got together with colleagues from Japan, Australia, New Zealand, um, folks in Hawaii and across the whole of the U.S. West Coast plus British Columbia, and looked at beach change data from 48 um, sites across five countries, three continents, 
to understand how these different modes of climate variability influence coastal hazards across the entirety of the Pacific. And so besides looking at ENSO, we looked um, at the PDO, we looked at the Southern Annular Mode, we looked at the Arctic Oscillation, all these different modes to see what is driving coastal change throughout the region. And what we found is that El Nino is just the dominant driver of coastal change um, across, the, across the region. And more specifically, ENSO. So during the positive El Nino phase, we see a significant elevation of wave energy in the Eastern North Pacific. Um, and conversely, we see a reduction in wave energy in the Southwest Pacific, Australia, and New Zealand. And this is primarily during boreal winter where there's these patterns really emerged. Um, and then with shoreline erosion, it's basically amplified. We see much more erosion during El Nino winters. And the opposite is true in Australia. And then conversely also during La Nina, um, these numbers are basically reversed. El, uh, Australia, New Zealand get hammered and the West Coast, uh, Eastern North Pacific gets hammered. Or uh, sorry, during La Nina, the, we have a, redu a re reduction in the amount of erosion we expect in the Eastern North Pacific during La Nina. So it's kind of this seesaw pattern um, where these different end members affect different parts of the Pacific. And, and moving forward, you know, there's some research that suggests that these end members are going to become more extreme. So we'll have more significant El Nino and La Nina events. So even without um, sea level rise, we could see an increase in coastal hazards just because the magnitude of these events um, is expected to increase based on, on some research. So this is some work that we published a couple years back in Nature and Geoscience to look at this sort of more broader picture of what's going on. Okay, so shifting gears now. So we have all this really anecdotal evidence. We talk a lot about the future and sometimes it's thought about in this dystopian way, but there's plenty of anecdotal evidence and right in your own backyard of these, of these large events that have happened in the historical past like the 82, 83 El Nino, which is really the biggest bomb for California um, in many, many decades, which a lot of us remember. I was living, grew, grew up in Southern California. I remember all the piers I loved in Santa Monica, Redondo Beach being destroyed um, in the February 1983 series of storms that hit during this El Nino event. And so we have this evidence from all over that these things have happened in the past. Um, we're not just looking at this at sort of future increase in storminess, we've had these events that happen on a periodic basis throughout the California coast that are putting us in harm's way. And we're seeing this happen more and more frequently. Um, there's parts of Santa Cruz in my own backyard now where these roads now we're seeing flooded um, every year during an annual storm, which maybe before were happening every five years or every 10 years. Um, there's lots of vulnerable areas throughout the state. Um, that are just becoming, and these are the areas that we, it's not going to be a surprise when the flooding just happens more and more frequently. And, but what's happening, or a lot of observations now throughout the state too, is just on high tides, we're seeing flooding. So so-called sunny day flooding in these very low lying areas like Imperial Beach, where it doesn't take a storm. Um, it just takes a high, a high tide or extreme high tide of king tide, where these kinds of issues can happen and, and more of this sunny day flooding, you know, almost a decade ago now, Newport Beach with just uh, some long period southern swell over top the berm and caused some major issues in the region. So the point is that we've, we have, we're really living in a lot of areas that are already very vulnerable, places like Sunset Beach, which have been flooding on high tides for decades. And so we're just going to see an increase in the frequency and magnitude of these events as sea level rise exacerbates the issue. So just let's get back a little bit about climate science and just some basic fundamentals. Here are the temperature observations from, that NASA's put out based on 6,000 weather stations, just to reinforce the idea that we have this incredible body of information um, across the whole sector of different climate science disciplines, including temperature, which shows how rapidly things are changing, um, especially in the, in the recent decades. And so I think it's just something to keep in mind. We're, this is really preaching to the choir here, but just that the body of evidence is so substantial. But we have to keep repeating these kinds of messages over and over when we go out in the communities that this is all based on observations. I mean, in this case, we're talking about literally billions and billions of data points from throughout the world um, 
captured in this particular animation. And similarly, it doesn't really matter, you know, what, what research group you look at, what govern from which government, you know, the projection, the observations of temperature change are very, very similar across different survey platforms, observational networks. It doesn't matter if you're at the Met, you're NOAA, you're NASA, you know, the observations are the same, temperature is increasing and it's increasing more rapidly in recent decades. And if anyone's looking for a good sort of accessible book to pass on to students, um, especially in the social sciences or sort of the non-science fields, if you have some classes like that, this is a great book by John Englander, which has a lot of nice uh, climate factoids, which kind of just focuses in on some nice little morsels that you can relate to the general public um, about climate science and, and the observations and the, the have been made throughout the world. In this case, it's just a simple one, which just which shows that the rate of temperature increase in the last two decades is 70 times faster than any time in the last 20,000 years. So we get this argument all the time. You've all heard it. Well, the climate has always changed. This is nothing new. It's part of the natural system, but 70 times faster is not part of the natural system. So why this matters is because as as the, as the earth warms, as oceans warm, um, water expands, this is the steric effect. And so we're increasing the volume um, of the ocean, raising sea level. The other major contributor to sea level rise is of course the melting of land-based ice, ice sheets and mountain glaciers. And these have been split about um, a third over the last century in terms of contributions to observed sea level rise, the steric effect, and then the mountain glaciers and the ice sheets contributing about a third each, but this is becoming more shifted toward the ice sheet contribution now and uh, beginning to overwhelm the steric contributions in general. There's lots of other factors in addition to this eustatic sea level rise. You know, there's ocean circulation patterns, there's local subsidence, there's terrestrial water storage, and then there's all these different time scales where these things can act in terms um, ocean basin configurations over, over many, many, many millennia, millions of years, <clears throat> control sea levels, um, the, the Milankovitch cycles, and then shorter term things like wind patterns, tidal patterns, storms, et cetera. <clears throat> but the bottom line and where a lot of the attention is being paid right now, and including a lot of people in, in your group, you know, Eric and Mateo and many, many others, is, is the instability of the ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland. And because there's a you know, 80 meters of stored sea level rise in those ice sheets. And that's why we're keeping a very close eye on how those are responding um, to warming. <clears throat> so moving forward, um, you know, global temperatures are expected to go, go past one and a half degrees Celsius above pre-industrial <clears throat> in just a decade or so. And this is the Paris target. The Paris target, the whole concept was to was to stabilize temperatures around one and a half degrees Celsius and keep them below two degrees Celsius. But by all indications, as we're tracking along RCP 8.5, we're gonna blast right through that within a decade or so. And from a coastal hazards perspective, the reason we actually care about this is because you know, 125,000 years ago, we had this, this analog you know, where temperature was about two degrees warmer than present, but sea level rise was eight meters higher, so about 25 feet or so. And so, you know, we, what we glean from this is that, you know, if we have two degrees increase in temperature, eventually, once the entire system responds, we're going to end up with about eight meters of sea level rise eventually. It could take centuries, but we're likely to get there based on what our observations of the past. There's also the question of how rapid sea level rise can change. You know, most projections now, the sort of the median is for about a meter of sea level rise by the end of the century. But, you know, in the historical, very recent historical uh, geologic past, during meltwater, meltwater pulse 1A, you know, we had five meters of sea level rise for four consecutive centuries. So we know we can, we can get this much sea level rise in a century with much less warming. <clears throat> of course, the dynamics are different. The continental ice sheets are much smaller. There's a lot we still are trying to understand, but the potential for a multimeter sea level um, rise in a century is out there. Now, current state guidance um, is looking at a most likely range of about 30 to 110 centimeters, which is maybe a little bit low based on more recent work. Um, but they have now placed an upper bound of three meters, which is 
a new advance in just the last few years in terms of what the, the possi most possible, highest plausible amount of sea level rise that could occur. And that's what the state is asking communities to plan for as the most extreme scenario. So three meters of sea level rise. Um, there's, there's new work coming out of the time though, um, especially in, in, when we get learn more and more about the work that a lot of you folks are doing in the Antarctic ice sheets. And what's really new in the sea level rise world is that, you know, two meters used to be the upper limit that thought was beyond was, it was not physically tenable to go beyond two meters by 2100. But we're starting to see some, some projects now, some research efforts, which are now putting two meters within the 95% confidence interval. So all these projections keep getting ramped up more and more, the, the more we understand about ice sheet behavior and response, which has increased significantly in the last decade, um, thanks to a lot of folks on this call. And especially since AR5, you know, we've, in the observational, not just the models have improved, but this is all based on the observational record, which has shown an increased mass loss, especially in the last four years or so um, as well. So this is clearly going to have a major impact if we have two meters of sea level rise, and I'll explain why. So if we kind of try to frame the problem at the global scale, you know, there's a billion people soon to live within 10 meters of, of sea level, present day sea level right now. And there's currently 700 million people living in that coastal zone. So we're on our way to a billion. There's 32 million people on the West Coast living in um, coastal counties. Um, just really simple bathtub projections suggest that about a million of those people are going to be exposed to daily flooding by the end of the century. And we look at the statistics of sea level rise, um, extreme water levels, you know, sea level rise is likely to cause the once in a lifetime flooding event to occur annually by 2050 and every day by 2100. And this is especially true on the West Coast. We have a very, very narrow band of extreme um, water levels. That is, we don't get a lot of storm surge. We get, you know, pretty large waves every winter, but they don't fluctuate considerably. So we sort of live and have built our infrastructure in this very narrow band with very little freeboard. And so just a little bit of sea level rise all of a sudden changes something that would happen once in a lifetime to every day, every single high tide by the end of the century. Um, we talk about people exposed to flooding in a bathtub sense, but when you consider storms, you consider coastal change, about three times more people would be at risk. And so it's really important, that's a niche we've tried to fill with our group, is to consider how the coast responds dynamically over time and how dynamic water levels affect community um, exposure to flooding. And in doing so across California, what we've determined is that on the order of 600,000 people and $200 billion in property will be at risk of sea level rise and storms um, by the end of the century. And, uh, you know, place in terms of GDP, this is about 6% of GDP. So it's a really big number. There's a lot of resources um, that are concentrated right along this narrow coastal strip. And so it's pretty significant. And when you look at these impacts by the end of century, based on historical wildfires, earthquakes, this is a number that's about 10 times larger than the worst wildfire seasons that we've ever had, the worst earthquakes we've ever had. Um, so this is a really significant issue. And the problem in the past is that the approaches to assess this exposure have been done in a static way using passive models, bathtub models, only considering tides. This is a very nice sort of first order screening tool to look at this potential issue, but it's only gonna get your, your everyday coastal um, flooding potential. So it's gonna under predict hazards. And an example here is from Foster City, which is one of the lowest line parts of the state, which shows an area protected by levees with just 25 centimeters of sea level rise, but a lot of the area in green here is below the flood surface, below the bay surface. But once you add a significant storm to the same sea level rise scenario, you can see that the potential for flooding across this entire city is significant. And so we've tried to bring along in this coastal storm modeling system all the physics that relate to water levels along the coast, 
um, forcing them with global climate models, including wind waves, atmospheric pressure, shoreline change, all these different components that go into a hazard assessment of the coast, and then doing this for a huge range of sea level rise and storm scenarios. So to do this, you know, we have to incorporate seasonal effects like El Nino. We have to consider storm surge, locally river discharge, uh, wave-driven processes, which are the dominant driver of flooding on the outer coast. So wave setup and run up. And then also the land is moving up and down, depends where you are, it's very complicated in California. So all these factors have to be considered, and that's what we've tried to do um, in our work across the state. And we've been marching up and sort of up and down the state, and we're done with the entire sort of southern two-thirds of the state now and in looking at these sea level rise and storm scenarios, and we're underway in the north coast now. Um, but this covers about 99% of the populated regions of California now. So it's all done in the can. We predict these hazards for a full range of sea level rise and storm scenarios. So zero to five meters and then from the daily conditions to your 100 year storm um, using the latest output from the CMIP, now CMIP 6 suite of models. Most work in California is done with CMIP 5. And then what's really important, I'm not going to probably emphasize enough, is that all the tools we've been developing has been in, in really cl tight collaboration with federal, state, city governments, um, lots of outreach, lots of interaction. Um, also, we can, we can streamline, we can customize the products to directly feed it into their planning process. So we're not just developing things that aren't going to be used. We know that these can, can fit right into their framework so they can make decisions. Um, with these, the model results right out of the box. Okay, so the model framework and what it looks like. So we scale from the global to the local. So we take the, the wind fields from the latest global climate models for G CMIP 5 and CMIP 6. We feed this into global wave models and then we dynamically scale, downscale to the eastern North Pacific. And once we get to the more regional scale, um, um, this wave modeling is done with WaveWatch 3, and then this all starts talking to all the suite of Delft models in the near, in the sort of shelf scale and near shore, including Delft 3D Flow and Swan. <clears throat> and so then we continue to downscale, bring in all the different um, oceanographic um, forcing conditions, the tides, and the water levels, and then we get scaling down to the very local level till we are modeling the physics as a finest scale is about 10 meters. And then we have a series of cross shore models um, using the X beach model, which is a, a beach and dune evolution erosion flooding model, which incorporates wave groups, which is really the big advance that X beach has, has, has contributed to sort of the modeling community the last decade. So we include the infragravity energy, which is the dominant driver of water levels um, during big storm events on the West coast. So. X beach is there in the background. We're also have developed models for looking at how the cliffs evolve through time, how the shoreline evolves through time. All that gets integrated into a high resolution DEM and then the storm and, and sea level rise scenarios are placed on top of that. So this is, there's a lot, I have a series of references at the very end if you wanna dig into this. There's, this is really sort of summarizing about 10 different papers in this one slide. What's, what's critically important though um, in any model is having good elevation data. And so that's a big focus that we've, that we've put a lot of effort into over the last uh, decade or so and getting the, la the latest LIDAR, the latest multibeam bathymetry, weaving all this latest topographic and bathymetric data sets together so we have a seamless surface which provides the foundation for the modeling and the flooding. Um, without that, you know, all the, the best physics in the world isn't gonna save you unless you have really good, precise, and accurate elevation data. This is just an example from Moss Landing showing that how this model progresses from offshore to onshore and resolves all these really important features, jetties and dunes and, and all the complicated infrastructure um, within the community there at Moss Landing. And so this is kind of how the models tend to look. We have usually a, a coarser resolution model um, <clears throat> off on the shelf and then in areas of interest in this particular example, Monterey, we keep scaling to finer and finer resolution until you see in the lower left, we have a really fine resolution along the community in Monterey and Sand City down to about 10 meter resolution where we're 
making our final sort of physics-based calculations and then projecting that onto a two-meter resolution DEM. So we go from what is about a 100-kilometer scale oceanographic forcing to a two-meter flood footprint on the ground. I think it's really important also is to, just to be really um, explicit about the uncertainty of these models. Um, just like any model, it's wrong. Um, then we're given a best prediction based on the physics and the observations that's calibrating and validating the model. So we, we want to be careful to convey to communities that we're what we often show is just a median projection of a particular scenario, but there's a whole range along this like a PDF type of curve of, of where the truth could actually be in the end. And so there's all this model uncertainty that we that goes into our projections on the back end. So we have to think about you know, how good is the model at predicting water levels at tide stations? You know, it has an RMS of about 12 centimeters, but there's a lot of areas that are distant from tide stations. We don't have as much confidence, so you know, we include uncertainty on that. The accuracy of the elevation data is another major factor. And then also just the, the motion of the, of the land up and down um, due to tectonics and subsidence in certain areas. And so for Southern California, we had a tectonic model that we used to do this. Um, but now NASA is, is just beginning to release uh, these vertical land motion maps in, from their sea level rise team. And this is using um, INSAR data. Uh, so about the last 15 to 20 years of INSAR data, you know, thousands of basically images. And now resolving vertical land motion at about a, you know, less than 100 meter scale across the California coast, which has an accuracy of about half a millimeter per year. Um, in the vertical, and this has been, you know, corroborated by GPS measurements. So this is like a new resource, whereas in the past we had very uh, coarse models. We had maybe a handful of GPS stations. Now we're getting information on vertical land motion, um, you know, every hundred meters along the coast. So it's a really tremendous resource to get a better understanding of how that contributes to coastal flooding. Um, Another major component here to incorporate is, is future shoreline change. So we have this flooding, but the coast evolves as well. And in general, rising sea level is going to drive shorelines landward. And it's, that's been going on forever in the geologic history. The difference is now we've drawn a line in the sand. Uh, we've placed structures that are immovable. And so this is essentially this coastal squeeze concept. We're pinning the, the beach between the, ocean, the rising ocean and infrastructure. And so we're losing our beaches. On top of that, we're reducing sediment supply from, from damming and dredging and aggregate mine, et cetera. So this is all complicating the beach erosion issue in the state and, and globally as well. So we put Sean Batusik on this task um, to develop a model for looking at how the shoreline, how the beaches will evolve in the future. And what he did is used an extended Kalman filter method. So what he's doing here is we have, this is a, a wave time series and then a future projection once we get to, I think in this case it's 2010, we have all these observations of shoreline positions. And then, so whenever there's an observation, all these model parameters are auto-tuned to match that data. So once we run out of data and move into a projection mode, um, we have a well-tuned model. Each one of these is every hundred meters along the entirety of California. And so we basically have on the order of about 10,000 tuned models based on local response to wave conditions, then we can make, have confidence in making a future projection. Um, and so more on that below if you really want to get into it. And so now across California, we have these projections where the shorelines will be in the future, just an example from Pacifica, showing how that shoreline is going to is move landward through time. And then similarly, um, cliffs are also at greater risk. And kind of think of cliffs, the base of a cliff and the waves like a hammer. The more often the base of that, that cliff toe is hammered by the ocean, which is gonna happen more frequently with sea level rise, the more prone the cliffs are to fail and retreat more rapidly. And so this is another factor we had to consider when we're looking at, at um, future impacts on the California coast and integrating this into the flooding. And so Pat Limber was another postdoc we had put on this. And what he did is, is grab all the latest and greatest cliff models from the literature, run them all in a Monte Carlo-like um, fashion, varying the parameters. So each model was run 100 times for every scenario. So every scenario has, a, has 500 runs for each sea level rise. 
And then we do a weighting based on model agreement and a 95% confidence interval. And then we see in the lower panel here, um, sort of the median projection and then the whole range of uh, the uncertainty and it gets larger and larger through time the further out you go. But this way you can kind of have these zones of, uh, of where the cliff hazard will be in the future um, based on this model ensemble projection. And so there's just an example showing the median projection, which is really common for a lot, a common sort of outlook for a lot of these coastal cliff, these areas where there's lots of infrastructure, you know, Malibu, you name it, this is a Capitola, but you can see there's a lot of, of homes that are in this potential hazard zone over the next century and beyond because of this, not only are they vulnerable today and there's issues today with cliff failures, that's what cliffs do, they fail, but the, the rates are gonna probably double um, in the coming decades due to sea level rise. And so all this gets woven together into making the flood projections through the Cosmos system, and then all gets served up on this Our Coast, Our Future tool, which shows these projections for the entire, um, for the state uh, outside of the North Coast, which is in Dunyet. And so it's in a Google Earth type interface. You can zoom in, zoom out. You can pick whatever you wanna look at. If it's the flooding, which is just shown here, if it's the wave conditions, the current conditions, the storm, the duration of the flooding, the uncertainty, you pick from any of 10 sea level rise scenarios and storm scenarios, and there's lots of other bells and whistles, but what people typically do is they zero into their area of interest, such as Newport here. Um, this is today, and as you can see, there's like parts of Balboa, which are below present day high tide, so it's shown in green, but they're not being flooded. And I should also note that Brett Sanders group has done a lot of fine scale work in this area and they've resolved some of the flood walls and structures that we cannot resolve here. <clears throat> um, so there's some uncertainty in this, but the, the bottom line is that it's a very vulnerable location. Um, and this is just the present day conditions. And then with just 25 centimeters of sea level rise expected by mid century or so, you know, Balboa is kind of the first highly area, highly vulnerable that is expected to flood this is just a daily basis, a daily flooding. This is one of the reasons that uh, Newport's investing millions of dollars in, in beefing up their flood walls because of that vulnerability based on a lot of the work that Brett's group has done um, and others. And so people typically go to the area of interest, start clicking through scenarios. Here's 50 centimeters of sea level rise for Newport. Here's um, 50 centimeters of sea, live, sea level rise with an annual storm. And you see the, the peninsula there is becoming more and more susceptible to flooding. And now we add one meter of sea level rise plus an annual storm. And then finally, um, possible end of century sea level rise under one of the more worst case scenarios. We see most of the areas vulnerable just to an annual storm, not a 20 year, 100 year. So one of the more vulnerable sections of the state, but Orange County in general, is very low line. Um, a lot of coastal Orange County is essentially reclaimed estuaries. And so it's not that big of a surprise that we should have this kind of vulnerability, but um, just to reinforce that it is there. And if we think about uncertainty and incorporate that, these potential flood zones expand even more dramatically. So, you know, outside of San Francisco Bay, Orange County really is ground zero for some of the potential impacts of climate change and storms. But, you know, in doing a lot of our outreach, you know, early on, especially the question kept arising is, you know, what does this all really mean to the bottom line? And so we developed this socioeconomic tool uh, known as HERA, uh, Hazards Exposure Reporting Analytics Tool. And there's a link here. This is the tool you can play with and look at, at, at um, these different types of uh, socioeconomic factors in terms of people in a flood zone, um, important emergency services in a flood zone, you know, amount of property, et cetera, across the state. So now we can look at a 2D flood map like this. And with HERA, we can translate that into what it actually means to policymakers, to folks in the govern off governor's office to try to move the needle on, on maybe thinking more proactively about adaptation. And so in doing this now across California, as I, as I mentioned at the outset, we, we've now identified that sort of in a worst case scenario by end of century, there's about half a million people in the flood zone, $200 billion in property, thousands of kilometers of roads and you know, hundreds of critical facilities, et cetera. So it's been a really effective way to break down data at sort of the census block, city level, county level, state level, um, in terms of what those impacts actually are. 
Okay, lastly, um, there's another hazard, which is really, we started getting more, more and more feedback too, especially from like water treatment facilities and a lot of these um, sort of these infrastructure, heavy infrastructure projects and sites along the California coast that you're starting to see like pump stations rusting more and more frequently due to saltwater intrusion. So we wanted to add an additional module to Cosmos, which talks about how the water table is responding to sea level rise along the coast. Now these are images from Miami, which is sort of ground zero for sea level rise impacts and the water table responding. And so they're seeing areas and communities where daily, you know, there's, like a perfect connection between the limestone aquifer and the ocean. So tide comes up, water level comes up inland, communities are flooded on a daily basis. And this is not the case in California, but there are some low-lying communities that could be affected by a rising water table, you know, outside of the potential impacts of overland flooding. And so there's the basic concept is that as sea level rises, the water table, which is basically intersects the ocean at sea level, I mean, that's pretty much what controls the water table. This water table is gonna respond as well. Whether it does in a linear fashion or nonlinear fashion depends on the hydrogeology. And that's something we're trying to get at in California. And so what we're about to release is a statewide map of the rise in the water table relative to the land surface across coastal California. And this is just an example here from Pacifica which shows overland flooding from Cosmos only after about a meter of sea level rise in extreme storm. But already today, shown in the warmer colors here, and red is gonna be when the water table intercepts the surface, there's already a very, very shallow water table in this location. And so as sea level rises about the same amount as we're shown on the left here, that water table is predicted to emerge from the surface um, without a storm, just as is a daily condition of essentially turning this area into something of a swamp, which would have to be mediated by pumping or, or some other um, barrier to prevent this from occurring. But then you add two meters of sea level rise, you can just see what can happen in some of these low-lying communities that may be as impacted by a rising water table um, or more so than overland flooding. And this kind of raises the question about some of these sort of key end members in terms of how we respond to sea level, you know, if we're gonna, you know, we talk about getting out of the way, elevating, blocking the sea, uh, restoring um, the region, but when it comes to groundwater, we have to think constructively, strategically, whether these are gonna work. Because, you know, the water table doesn't care um, about these coastal defense structures. So it's a complicated issue. And so and there are other ones just to consider in general, which I've touched on here um, for the 21st century. And that is, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. We don't know what the 21st century sea level rise curve is gonna exactly look like. We know we're tracking along higher um, RCP projections, but we don't know how we're gonna respond um, in the coming decades um, from like a you know, socio-political standpoint, for example. Uh, there's uncertainty about how storm patterns are going to change, whether it's increase in storminess in other parts of the world or here, whether El Ninos are going to become more severe. That's still uncertain. We don't know how the shorelines are going to evolve. We know based on our research that we could lose half of our beaches if all the infrastructure remains in place and we keep, keep holding the line and we don't nourish beaches. So that's an issue. And more than that, we don't know about the human factors, how we're going to how we're gonna manage the coast, how we're gonna to respond to these kinds of issues, and that's gonna affect the projections that were shown today. And then the last topic I wanna to touch on here, I'm taking up plenty of my time, is how are we gonna communicate the science and really move the needle? <clears throat> and there's really been a big push the last four years that science communication, we're still way behind. We still need to work a lot more with social scientists, psychologists, and how we communicate the science. And and so here's just an example of a video which we developed with some folks from Pixar for flooding in um, <clears throat> a particular region in California here at Central Coast Capitola, which we're using, uh, this is augmented reality here, um, but it can be viewed in a virtual reality setting and it's gonna be released soon if you have some goggles, you can look at it. But this is a, one of these communication tools for the public
to kind of give them a sense for what the future could look like and how they could be immersed in this. And so I'll just let this go for a second. This is all based on Cosmos data. So all the elevations are real. <clears throat> Everything is, is fundamentally based on the science, but just using some more sophisticated special effects and animation and using this virtual reality um, structure to try to immerse people in this information and get them to really feel and understand what the future might look like if we don't do anything. So this is just one example of a way we're going to try to communicate the science in a more effective way to the public. We've also done some work down in Santa, Mar Santa Monica using augmented reality. Um, we uh, did this through this uh, OWL um, project, and these are these you know, telescopes that you see at the beach. And what happens is you go there, you look through them, and you see the present day conditions. <clears throat> we know where the shoreline was prior to massive amounts of beach nourishment in Southern California. And then you click through and it says this is what the future looks like with one meter sea level rise. And this is what the future looks like with one meter sea level rise plus an extreme storm. And then you click through again and say, well, here's a possible solution that can mitigate the potential impacts of this flooding. So just another tool to try to engage the public based on science, um, not just a pure, you know, it's not a cartoon. This is, you know, everything is based on science here to try and engage the public. In this case, you had about 10,000 people come through and look at this and, and fill out surveys to tell us what they thought about it. So all this work um, collectively is going in, into a larger effort at USGS, um, which I'm helping push forward to build these kinds of products, these kinds of flood maps across the entire of US and US territories. You know, we've done this for the for Southern two thirds of California. It's currently being built out in Alaska, in Puget Sound, Southeast, a bunch of Pacific islands. And we're working toward having a complete seamless coastal flood map projection for all of the United States within about five to seven years using this sort of fundamental um, cosmos framework that I talked about today. So with that, um, just wrap up and say, you know, we're moving this toward the national scale. One of the things we're working on a lot more now is, is satellite imagery and how to, how to leverage this incredible new um, sort of data stream from satellites with sub-meter scale resolution and daily passes to help to support our modeling work. Uh, using the most recent release of uh, global climate models to resolve finer scale um, you know, weather patterns and features such as atmospheric rivers and tropical cyclones and doing a lot more work on operational flood modeling of late too, especially looking at compound flooding. So all this uh, information is here, ha contact me anytime. Uh, you can get all the Cosmos data here for a direct download. You can also look at it interactively at our Coast Our Future or the socioeconomics and the HERA tool. So with that, I'll turn it over for questions and just note that when you make this public, there's lots of uh, references here at the end if you're interested in really digging deep into any of the aspects I talked about today. So thank you so much for your time and happy to field a few questions for uh, overstaying my welcome. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Fantastic talk.